How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. It's really good to see you. Uh, Josh and I have known each other for, for many, many years. Um, we kind of came up in the ranks in the, in the uh, sort of popular music, uh, weekly mm -hmm. cultural journalism type of thing. Uh, I won't date us, so I won't say what decade. I'll, I'll do that in a second. <laughs> um, but I've been a huge admirer of Josh um, since I first, very first met him, and he continues to amazing work uh, daily, Thank weekly, you. monthly, and so it's super awesome to be here with you, man. Thank you. It's an honor to be. I've been in dialogue. I feel like I'm in dialogue with with your work um, uh, ever since you've started writing. Um, and uh, it's really Back when I was five years old. That's right. <laughs> it's true. You didn't know it. That was me in the other room. Um, we've also learned how to dress like each other. We totally um, like coordinated. We're like, yeah. <laughs> so if this goes well tonight, we're gonna we're thinking about starting a boy band, which I think it's gonna go <laughs> go really well. A post boy band. We're not post, boys anymore. Post that's right. boy. We're we're both post young Come on, now, man. So. We can do it. Um, so I wanted to. Um, uh, it's just really a thrill to be here and a thrill to be able to be in, be in dialogue with Jeff's uh, work of the past, but, but also this in particular, this, this, this new book, which Can is... Can we say also thank you to Scripps yes. and yes, yes, to yes. all of you for coming out tonight. Thank yes. you so much you. For, for hosting this. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, the new... The, yeah. The new <laughs> <laughs> for you all. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I wanted to dive in kind of... I, I, since the new book, the new book uh, ends... Um, with someone named Beyonce. Um, <laughs> uh, because you can't begin with Beyonce because after right. Beyonce, it's over. there's nothing what are you gonna do? to say. That's right. Yeah. Um, um, I, I wanted to, uh, and you, you, you write, we'll get back to this, but you write about, you write about Lemonade um, uh, towards the end. Uh, it's, the, it's the finale. Um, but I wanted to, in the spirit of Beyonce, not literally, but in the spirit of Beyonce, um, particularly of formation, um, to talk about the importance of formation. Um, and there's lots of ways we can, we can read and interpret that term. But I wanted to maybe start for those who don't know um, the kind of history of your, of your work and, and indeed the, the, particularly the, um, the period where you and I started to overlap, which I think is important for framing your work, um, to talk about your own intellectual formation and political and cultural formation. Mm. Um, we're not going to have time to do the whole Jeff Chang yeah, uh, biography. Yeah, but there, it seems like there were also these two kind of key... Um, in formally intellectual sites um, for you, which um, would be UC Berkeley yeah. um, up north and then UCLA. Yeah. Uh, sure. And you were at UCLA f during the 92 uprisings, correct? Uh, no, I was no? there. We, I was part of the first class in the Asian American Studies master's program okay. that entered after the riots. After, got it. Um, and so intellectually, it was a, a period of really intentional, uh, yeah, intentional and intense mm -hmm. ferment for sure. So could you talk about those two places, be it if not just the institutions themselves, but, but, but the Bay Area um, and Los Angeles as, as kind of geographic um, spots for you? Sure. And also about the time, I guess. Too. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and this is where I do have to date myself. So I entered um, Cal actually uh, as the anti-apartheid movement was peaking and uh, got to experience that as a freshman. That was sort of my first um, political activist experience was sort of engaging with the anti-apartheid movement. And at the same time that that was happening, Bay Area hip hop was really just going off, you know? So it, it felt like for me, um, I don't know actually how I got a degree because by night I would be, uh, you know, DJing, learning how to DJ, hanging out and that kind of thing with uh, all of these amazing musical historians of funk like Ricky Vincent and of hip hop like Davey D and Billy Jam. And then by day I was out, you know, like fist in the air and doing the activist thing. And somewhere out of that I got a degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was also the period of the culture wars. And this is something that I tried to talk a lot about in, in Who We Be and revisiting that particular period. And it deeply, deeply shaped me, uh, this idea that we were a generation, in fact, I was in the first class at UC Berkeley that was more than 50% non-white. And, um, and that was some sort of a Rubicon that had been crossed, I think, for a lot of conservatives. And so at that particular moment, we were out on the campus, you know, uh, in front of Sprawl Plaza, um, protesting for more diverse curriculum, more diverse faculty, um, we were asking for more services for retention and recruitment. 
Um, in other words, we were asking for pretty much all the same things that student protesters across the country were asking for last year. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's sad to me in some ways, it's very sad to me that my kids now are fighting the same battles that I felt like I was fighting when I was in my 20s. It's, it's in, incredibly sad to me. Um, I feel like that was a battle that we left um, to the next generation, but it deeply impacted me. Um, I never really forgot that, even during periods where the culture wars receded. And then I came to Los Angeles uh, in 92 after working in the state capitol for three years and also um, starting up a, a, a label with a bunch of friends called Soul Sides. Um, that, uh, uh, and that was a time, I should say, that was also a period full of intellectual ferment and felt like the utopian dreams, if you will, of the 60s had collapsed in the riots. And we were making a new way. In some ways, um, a lot of our elders were looking to the younger folks to try to explain what had just happened. Um, and, and so, you know, that period was a period in which I really started getting deeper into writing about um, hip hop. And that became sort of the mode, the vehicle to be able to discuss the kinds of uh, issues around race uh, and, and equity that uh, here we are still talking about now. Writing about hip hop, but also helping in produce hip hop. Producing um, hip hop, and, yeah, as and, well. And get yeah. rec I think that's actually how we might have first met, or at least how I first heard of you was when I was trying to get an interview with DJ Shadow. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I had to go through this Jeff Chang guy. Yeah. I was a gatekeeper. <laughs> you were a gatekeeper. Um, but Berkeley was also, and you write. But you, you got the interview. So I, I did get the interview. One. I totally got the interview. Um, uh, and it was a great interview. In the yeah. new book, you know, you spend, you have a whole chapter where you talk about the Berkeley days for you, particularly around um, uh, Asian American identity mm -hmm. and your own awareness uh, or kind of shocking kind of the, that you were shocked into this identity um, right. as a kind of minoritarian uh, space for you which was new yeah. um, could you talk a little bit as a because it is a um, it's a biographical story that is I think really important to the issues you're writing about oh, wow. in the book. okay um, and nobody's ever asked me that but it's true it's like I grew up in Honolulu Hawaii and my family uh, has been there probably for about on my dad's side, four generations. On my mom's side, we think it's like five, could be six. I still have to kind of trace it all the way back. And by now, we've intermarried all across the board. So our family, like, our family photos look like the United Nations. Actually, when Obama got elected, we're like, yeah, that actually looks exactly like the way our family looks like, you know? Right. Um, and so I grew up never necessarily having had the sense of being a minority. And moving to Berkeley, of all places, um, which I probably thought was supposed to be a safe space in some respects, um, I immediately encountered, you know, microaggressions on up to physical, you know, uh, forms of hate. Um, not necessarily hate violence in the way that it's been practiced, but like, I was definitely getting pushed around and, and called all kinds of racial slurs. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, like, I've never had to deal with this before, and that set me on this 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 uh, path, which you know that age is a period of trying to find yourself and your identity, anyways. Um, but trying to figure out what that all meant, and it, it awakened in me a certain sense of, of of justice. And I think that that's probably a lot of the reason that I was attracted to the anti-apartheid movement. Mm -hmm. um, the title the title of the new book, "We Gonna Be All Right." Um, about oh, actually, sure, I should add something. Oh, go for it. Um, just in a really almost corny kind of way, um, I feel like my work is um, motivated by this idea of the family in that respect, mm -hmm. you know? That, you know, you, you've got the uncles that, uh, that you go to the parties with and you don't really want to hang with them. You've got the aunts that kiss you too hard. And you've got, you know, the cousins that drink too much. And there's always, like, beef happening. But it's still the family, right? And so maybe in a way, in a sort of really corny kind of way, I, I feel like society should kind of be like that, you know? Uh, folks from all these different kinds of backgrounds um, figuring out how to, how to make it work together. 
Well, that actually uh, is really why I wanted to ask you about the title. Oh, um, okay. And so this is, yeah. this is perfect because it's like I was uh, in my class this semester, which is on, it's a course dedicated to studying race and popular music um, in the U.S. And we started on first day of class by, I played them the full uh, audio recording of Kendrick Lamar's song. And we debated for quite a while around what the title means and how you take, and the chorus, and how you take what those different words and phrases mean. I'm just wondering for you why you chose that um, phrase as the title and, and how you would break down the different, the, you know, the we of it, the gone of it, and the all right of it. <laughs> like, how do you define those terms? Because they're really important terms. I right? think you guys have thought about this more than I have. No, that's not true. <laughs> um, I'd actually like to, like to hear that, that, that conversation. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. I mean, you know, obviously it's a song that I think has become the anthem, right, of right now. Um, from obviously the movement, on black li the movement for black lives to uh, all these other types of protest movements that have, have come up in the wake of that. And not just for African-American uh, organizers and activists, um, that's where it started, but it's spread. You know, I see it um, in Asian American spaces, I see it in Pacific Islander spaces, I see it in all kinds of spaces, in uh, indigenous spaces as well, um, Latino spaces. People are using this song as a way of trying to say almost like, because if you look at 95% of the lyrics, it's Kendrick talking about struggle and being in struggle. And trying to almost contain some of his, uh, his more, um, his more, um, mm, I don't know, strong impulses, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, my knee's getting weak, you know, and my gun might blow, right? But then at the same time, he's at the preacher's door, right? So he's trying to figure it out. He's trying to work it out. He's got all of this anger within him, and he doesn't necessarily know what to do with it, but he's trying to find some sort of a redemption. And yet, out of all of this, but we're still gonna be all right, you know? Mm -hmm. So this notion that you can pull hope out of a life of struggle, right? That you can still have something that, that, that you can live for. That's, I think, the leap of faith that the Movement for Black Lives uh, sort of put in our heads. Like, we can make this leap to be able to really understand the roots of racial injustice in this country. And if we can make that leap, we can make the bigger leap, which is to actually move us on to the path, reorient us to the path towards getting towards justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. You would have done perfectly fine in the class. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> great answer. So, um, I mean, I, I also w was very taken with the title, of course, because of, of the musical reference, yeah. um, which, and I know that music is uh, both for, for us, between us as, as, as friends and colleagues, has been a common link uh, of our interests. But, but, but obviously, we're living in this really complicated moment right now, which this book so eloquently struggles with and deals with, where, as you just said, a song by a black hip hop artist um, can become a, a, an anthem or a refrain across communities, mm -hmm. right? So that multiple communities and different backgrounds can all connect with this one song. Right. At the same time, as the, sub, the, the subject of the book points out, we're in a, a moment of um, what you call resegregation. Um, and I was reading today, there was a piece that came out about um, the show um, Atlanta on FX mm -hmm. that we were just talking about a little bit. I don't know if people have been watching Atlanta, um, but about, and it asked the question, um, you know, is this the, um, is this the end of, or is this the beginning of um, the end of debates around is diverse TV good or bad, mm. right? So then now we are with, between Empire, Atlanta, um, uh, Blackish, uh, you know, a ton of other shows Shop that all feature um, yeah. cast of color. Yeah. In the case of Atlanta, has an all black writing room. Mm -hmm. um, we, ha we, we are at a moment where you could argue, I'm not sure we would, but you could argue that we are at a, a peak level of cultural integration. Mm. And yet, as your book talks about for us, we are at a peak level of, of, um, of resegregation, of social resegregation. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how, how you, as someone who's so um, attuned to culture and to politics, do you see these things at all? Um, is there a kind of tension between those two things? Absolutely. I mean, I feel like it's the core tension that we're dealing with 
right now in American society. Um, and I think that that was the sort of tension, the core tension that was animating the research that I was doing for, for Who We Be. Um, and so this book began because Who We Be came out literally about two months before the non-indictment of Darren Wilson um, in the killing and the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson. And the conversations completely changed during that particular time. So this race conversation that we have, right, which bubbles back up every once in a while um, uh, in times of crisis in particular, uh, um, uh, I felt like was, was, was begun and then diverted in so many ways. The movement for black lives got us to focus on the growing inequality, the yawning inequalities, right, between the races on, 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 on premature death, right, on life expectancy, on policing, like on militarization, right, on health, on wealth, on income, on housing, on schooling, all of these different types of things. And, and in some ways, what happened was the, the conversation was quickly diverted into this strange debate about whether or not those who are protesting racism were in fact themselves racist, right? And these strange slogans, all lives matter and blue lives matter. Well, right. if we're gonna make good on this idea that all lives matter, then we have to focus on the fact that by all indices, it would seem that black lives don't matter as much as other lives. Um, and so we have to be able to say black lives matter uh, to move it past aspiration into something that becomes a real truth, mm -hmm. right? It's a living, breathing um, kind of truth. And that's sort of where I think the, the, the impetus um, for the book came from um, in some ways, was to be able to say that this particular movement, by starting this kind of conversation, um, we have to get this conversation focused on the factual and what's really going on, right? And sort of critique and understand that the picture of diversity um, is out there. And we're happy for that. Representation is key. It's a very important type of thing. But what about access? What about power? Um, and I think that that's been the motivating, you know, sort of factor in the student protests that broke out last fall, first at the U University of Missouri and then spreading across the U.S. Is, is where else but at colleges and universities are we so fed and inundated with images of diversity. Mm -hmm. And then when students get here, the lived experience is something that's not too much different than what it was for us, you know, back in the 80s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and hence the same kinds of student demands uh, being repeated over and over and over. So we get into this crisis cycle, right? There's a crisis, there's a reaction to that, there's a backlash. And then we fall into this period of exhaustion and complacency. And that was, for me, the, the sort of three months between uh, Obama's election in November of 2008 and January 1st, when Oscar Grant was killed, mm -hmm. right, before the inauguration. Um, this is this post-racial period when we're living in this period of exuberance feeling that we've maybe crossed the threshold. And now we're in this post-post-racial era where all of these things, uh, all of these unresolved types of issues that get left by the wayside um, in this sort of discussions that come out of the crisis cycle um, suddenly surge back to the fore. Because the large thing that's happened, if you look over the last 50 years, has been the overturning of this infrastructure of laws, and uh, judicial decisions and ideas and protocols that have been about moving us towards racial equity and cultural equity. Um, the slow and sometimes really fast erosion of, of these kinds of ideals. Um, and then sort of the, the, the shift that happens in, in the late 90s um, from diversity being sort of the scary radical type of thing right. that we have to kind of um, limit in some sort of a way. Uh, to something that, that actually can be made into uh, uh, something that pays, that be, can be turned into an asset. Uh, and so corporations and ins institutions make this shift in the late 90s. Um, and so the period that we're in now is a period where we've returned to the, 
to the culture wars. We've, we've moved back into this crisis type of period. And my worry is that we'll move through this period uh, through reaction to it, and we probably are in the middle of this backlash period, um, and this election will tell us a lot about what the shape of that backlash yeah. is gonna look like. Um, again, into complacency around this, and we won't be able to address the real factual questions of growing inequality between the races. It's funny to think about the, if we're now living in a, in, in a new version of the old culture wars or in a, in a perhaps a, slight, in a slightly different one, but I almost think back you know, to those you know, 80s and 90s days where as frustrating and energizing as the culture wars were, um, the terrain was almost easier to mark out in some ways, like you felt like that there was an easy, I felt like there was an easily definable center and there was an easily definable margin um, and that was part of the grounds of the debate. Now I think things are so often so complicated where you look and can look at cultural representation and cultural and, and you know, artistic production in the art world, which you also write about in the book, which I'll ask you something about in a sec, um, where it doesn't look the same as it did in the 80s and 90s, and yet the inequalities are actually perhaps even worse in right. some ways. Absolutely. So that there is this masquerade of arrival, mm -hmm. um, this masquerade of a recentering um, that is perhaps just as bad as it was. Right. I mean, if you look in culture, right, this is the thing that sort of Oscars So White helped to shine a light on. Um, 90%, something like 90% of museum directors and the positions that are in uh, uh, decision-making sort of authority are, are still held by white folks, right? Um, we got our first executive of color, a woman of color, um, last year when ABC, you know, decided to make a shift. And Spike Lee reminds folks that we still don't have anywhere near that kind of um, uh, power within the film industry. Um, and so, so cultural equity is, is is absolutely there. It, it, we have the appearance of diversity, the picture right. of diversity, uh, but again, the reality of inequity and these growing gaps. Something like, um, they, so, so New York City did a survey of all of its arts organizations that it gives money to, over a thousand arts organizations, and, and something like 70% of, of, of those organizations said, um, I think we're doing really, really well on, on diversity. But then if you looked at the boards, the makeup of the boards, um, it was more than 70% white. And this is, I think, that was one of my favorite parts of the book, when you call on, when you note that study. Because that, to me, is part of what's so complicated, mm -hmm. is that you have these organizations that actually feel like, and will look at you in the straight face and say, like, oh, we're very diverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, they're not at all. Right. But the belief, the Kool-Aid is so strong, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way that that diversity has been repackaged as a kind of um, neoliberal cultural asset, mm -hmm. right? That it's not about bodies, mm -hmm. um, or, or it's not about equity. It's right. about um, the right language in a press release, um, the right faces that are selectively used in a press release, yeah. um, showing the right art but not having the, the right curator, yeah. that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but there is this belief that things are more diverse than they were when the numbers show that they aren't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's much more complicated than it was mm. in the 90s in some mm -hmm. way. I think that, yeah, I think I, I can see that point definitely and I think that you're right. And the urgency is that we are hurtling towards 2042, right? right? Exactly. Which is the year that it all goes to hell, of course. Um, <laughs> the year that we become majority minority, right? And so the question becomes right now, uh, if we don't try to figure out a way out of the, the cycle of crisis, or the mm -hmm. crisis cycle, do we get to 2042 and have a society in which color and caste and class are converging mm -hmm. um, even more than they already are? Uh, and that's, I think, the, the future that would be the worst case scenario for all of us. So could you talk a little bit about this term, this really powerful term, resegregation, which is the umbrella term that kind of encompasses a lot of these ideas. It's a, it's a, it's a strong term, mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine maybe you've already gotten this kind of feedback, um, but I can imagine commentators saying like, You're, are you actually arguing that we're going back to segregation? And I'm wondering if you could talk about how you define the term and how you define it if we're post, what was it, post, post? Po post, post racial, right. Post, post racial <laughs> and post civil rights, or maybe even post, mm -hmm. post civil rights. Yeah. Um, 
uh, how resegregation relates to um, uh, an earlier era that we more frequently will define as the era of segregation? Hmm. Well, I mean, the first thing to note is that segregation in many places never ended, right? Um, and, and I think when I use the term resegregation, um, it could have been with like that post <laughs> modern thing with the slash between the re and the segregation or something. Um, but it could, it could, it, it could refer to uh, this notion that we have been uh, in this type of state in which we've undone a lot of the measures that we put into place to try to move us towards equity. Um, and, and so I don't actually have to make the argument. The numbers tell the story, right? In 1989, we saw the peak of desegregation uh, in the schools. Um, and now what we see is something like um, upwards of 80% of black and Latino students att attending majority minority schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on, on the air this morning um, uh, with Minnesota Public Radio, which I was told has the largest gaps between white students and students of color of anywhere in the country. Um, and Myron Orfield, who studies these things, noted that over the last 20 years, uh, something like, I can't remember the exact number, but at least, uh, there's at least 50% more high schools that have crossed the 90% minority threshold, mm -hmm. right? Um, and at the same time, what we see is the average white student attends a school that's over 75 or 76, 77% white. Yep. Um, and whites are actually the most racially isolated group yep. of all. Um, and it's very so, hard. It's very hard for us. <laughs> yeah, we really are struggling with that isolation. There's yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you don't like white on white sarcasm, Jeff. White on white sarcasm. <laughs> you guys should stop that. You I know. know. That we it's, try. It's really hurting your people. As a Jew, it's very hard to do that. <laughs> But like a big part of the resegregation is about is about schools, right? It's about schools, schools and it's about gentrification yeah. and urban removal or urban renewal, yeah. right? Which which yeah. you do a great. There's a great part of that of that chapter, I think, on the kind of racial the hidden racializations of those terms, mm -hmm. right? Of urban renewal as actually uh, black removal. Right. This is exactly what James Baldwin said when he visited right. the Western Edition in 1963 in San Francisco. And now the Western Edition has gone from being something like 42% black at that particular period to less than 20% black. Right. Um, we've seen a huge decimation in the Bay Area of the black population. Right. Um, and I, it, 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 it uh, the numbers are there. The numbers are stark. When you look at, for instance, median uh, uh, income, right, for different households in San Francisco County, the gap is something like four times, I think three or four times, right? The, the, the white median uh, household income is over $100,000, and black household uh, median income is somewhere around twenty five dollars to $29,000, I think, uh, are the numbers now. Um, there's been a decimation of the black middle class yep. and a drastic reduction in the number of, of African Americans living in San Francisco and even Oakland now. So people have to move somewhere, right? Um, this is why I don't think that gentrification is an adequate word to describe what's going on. Um, gentrification as a word centers the gentry. It centers the wealth exactly. that's moving into the city. And it disappears the folks who are displaced. Right? And so where do those folks go? They go to Antioch, they go to Oakley, they go to Tracy, they go to Stock, they go to the suburbs that have now moved the Bay Area, the Yay Area, mm -hmm. right? Uh, out uh, all the way to, to Roseville, to okay. Tracy, to Stockton, uh, to Gilroy. Um, it, the Yay Area now encompasses like nine counties or something like that, three or four metropolitan areas. And the reason I say Yay Area is because Hyphy made me understand this. Like, you start hearing all of these records and you're like, wow, where do those, where do those, where's this coming from? And you find out the folks live in Fairfield and they live right. in, in Vallejo, right. right? And so while we have a picture of stuff happening in Oakland and, and in San Francisco and that kind of thing, I mean, the Fillmore rap scene has disappeared, literally, right? And this, so, is, and this is a huge issue, I think, for those who study um, these kinds of displacements. I mean, I, I was telling you a little bit earlier, I'm in the middle of just starting a project in San Francisco right now trying to deal with music and eviction and displacement. 
and in a, a meetings we were having with a lot of nonprofit groups um, in the city, and I came in thinking I really understood what was going on and you know, had all my policy reports and all my information, and everybody had a version of the response that you have in your book, which is um, everybody's studying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Um, or we've, we've studied uh, the processes of gentrification pretty well up to this point. What we haven't studied is what happens to everyone who leaves. Right. And where do those stories go? Right. And where do those memories go? Right. And that there's this kind of diaspora of displaced narratives and displaced life stories and displaced histories that nobody's collecting. Mm -hmm. um, that it's very hard, if you're trying to do the research, to track down people once they've been evicted from their homes, once they've been forced to leave their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and so who's telling those stories and who are keeping if the Yay area is now extending into this network of, of endless uh, Northern California suburbs, who knows where everybody is? Right. Well, we, you know, people know where people are, right? People move to um, neighborhoods um, as migrants do, you know, because they know that, that other folks are there, right? Mm -hmm. And, but you never kind of overcome that sense of root shock is what it's called, I guess. This idea that you could knock on your neighbor's door and and uh, and be like, "Hey, can I borrow some sugar?" Right? Mm -hmm. Or would you watch my kids because I have to do an extra shift tonight? Or um, y you know, or or knowing the teacher lives down the block, so if your 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 child's having trouble in school, you can knock on their door and say, "Hey, what can I do?" You know, those kinds of networks uh, aren't really replaceable, and that's the root shock that occurs. But the flip side of it is that these new networks are forming in a lot of ways, right? So Fairfield is speaking to East Oakland, right? And Vallejo is speaking to, uh, to, to East Palo Alto. When Kendrick Lamar went up to make the video for All Right, um, part of the reason that they did it in the Bay Area is because of directors from Berkeley. Um, and part of it was, I think, that they were trying to honor you know, the, the amazing activism from the Black Panthers all the way and up to Black Lives Matter Oakland now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because the kids that came in to dance were some of the kids that we have been knowing in East Palo Alto, right? So there's these interesting kinds of networks that get created through these creative avenues, literally these creative avenues of, of expression. And, um, and I think that in that sense, the story is not only of loss, there's severe and deep loss. Um, and and the, 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 the fact is, is that the loss um, leads to more precarity. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to deal with, right? Um, but also to recognize too that, that there is always agency and people are always forming these amazing creative ecosystems that help to imagine uh, the, the Yay area in new kinds of ways, right? right? right. One of the things that you, um, when you were writing Who We Be, um, you were involved, correct me if I'm wrong, with kind of um, almost getting into policy work a little bit. Um, a little bit yeah. um, <laughs> and talking about uh, the, the idea of, <laughs> of um, how culture can prophecy politics mm -hmm. a little bit or predict. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Because it was a very provocative idea, and it was very much a, a part of the moment um, with Obama in the White House, or the Obama's arrival in the White House. Right. Um, and I'm wondering how, it, how, how would you think about that report and those ideas in the same way at this moment? Absolutely. I mean, well, well you know, I, there's, a, there's a sort of dialect that there's this sort of dynamic action that's happening between culture and politics. One of the things that we'd like to say at the Institute for Diversity in the Arts is that cultural change always precedes political change. You have to be able to have the imagination to even go there. So records coming out in the 1980s where people are talking about black president, right? Even Fela Anikolapokudi talking about black president, right? Which hip hoppers were, you know, reviving back in the 80s even. Um, those gave us the imagination to even think that there could be an Obama and literally this gets translated into activism when folks from our generation start saying, we gotta figure out how to leverage this cultural power that we built into political power. Mm -hmm. So that happened and it's still happening. And even within the Obama election, you know, Shepard Ferry's street poster, street art poster goes out and that inspires a, a whole bunch of images of what hope and change could actually look like that go far beyond the Democratic Party platform, right. that go far beyond the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Obama agenda. Um, so, you know, there's that happening. What I think has happened over the last two and a half years 
uh, three years is that the, the uprisings have generated some amazing creative work, yeah. right? Um, and so what we've seen is black artists reacting to the Black Lives Matter movement by creating uh, work that speaks to a vision of what it means to live and what it means to live together, right? And that in, in so many ways has influenced all of us. So this brings us back to like, you know, Beyonce yeah. uh, information and Lemonade. And we could talk about Kamasi Washington. We can talk about um, D'Angelo, right? We could talk about No Name's new album. We could talk about Michael Kiwanuka's album. We could talk about all yeah. kinds of folks in music. We could talk about Simone Lee's work in contemporary art. Mm -hmm. um, we could talk about all of these different types of things. It's been really generative in that kind of sense. Yeah. And so the thing that inspires me is that the, the culture, even during these moments when politics seems untenable, that we can't even imagine a bill coming out now that would demilitarize the police, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone gun control, right? Let alone like reducing, you know, mass incarceration, you know, giving folks um, um, actual opportunities, right? Uh, and closing down and ending the prison industrial complex. We can't even imagine those kinds of things happening in the political environment that we have now. The culture becomes the place for all of those ideas to bubble uh, and to take shape and to grow our imaginations for change. So in response to that, it's a question that, that I get asked a lot about my own, because I share your, sure. um, uh, your opinions about this in many ways, but the question that I get often that I, I think is, is an important one to keep on the table is, so if, if those imaginations at the level of culture are for the most part, well, in, in all cases, are happening also at the level of high capitalism, mm -hmm. um, and within the frame, within the overt framework of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. um, be it record companies or, um, you know, multinational branding deals or Pepsi sponsorships or mm -hmm. all the complicated things that, that culture is right now. Right. Um, what do we do with that? What do we do with, is, it, is, is cultural imagination at the level of cultural imagination enough or are we always talking about a larger dismantling? Um, you know, if, if Beyonce, in a way, ends formation with the referencing the idea of a black Bill Gates in the making, mm. right? Is that the horizon? Right. Um, and <laughs> students always, you know, say yes and no, yes and no. Um, uh, or, yeah. or is it um, imagining a different kind of economic model mm. for social change? Mm. I think it's all of the above, right? I think that, I, I, I suppose I'm a pragmatist in this kind of a way. Um, I, and, and I come from the generation, you know, where public enemy said, we're gonna bum rush the show, right? We're gonna infiltrate the culture and we're gonna try to turn its organs against it, so to speak. Um, and that failed <laughs> miserably <laughs> in so many ways. And yet at the same time, it succeeded, right? Um, and so, so there's that. I think that you need to be able to reach the popular Right, the, the, the space of, of the masses, so to speak, the social. Um, and you also need to be building these alternative visions um, uh, from the grassroots up, you know. And so in that sense, I've been really motivated and, and, and um, moved by visions like Grace Lee Boggs, who thinks of revolution as something that builds up, yeah. um, almost but not quite in an anarchist kind of a way, like from the totally. grassroots type of up, from the community level uh, uh, up. Right, and that it's, it's, it's about shifting the consciousness. It's not about blood, it's not about war, it's about shifting people's consciousness. It's about transformational justice. Um, I think we're gonna open up to, to the audience in a little bit, but I wanna, uh, soon, I wanna ask one final segue question, okay. if that's okay. Um, and it, it's in regards to Oscar So White, um, mm -hmm. and which you write about as a key, uh, key event and a key, key happening. Um, and you write about that series of protests um, among other things, in, in relationship to an article that Chris Rock published in Variety. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, it was an interview. Hollywood Reporter? Or, I don't know what, yes, yeah, a Hollywood Reporter. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Variety. Okay. I, whatever, yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, where he made some very, very, very strong and powerful statements about anti-Mexican racism mm -hmm. in Hollywood. And it uh, was almost a kind of deferral mm -hmm. of um, of a kind of, let's say, anti-blackness within Hollywood and saying like, Why, we, can't, we need to talk about anti-Mexicanists in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Oscars come right. and that kind of drops out. Mm -hmm. um, 
stereotypes of, of Asian Americans um, are, part of the, are part of the performance. Things get complicated, um, and not, uh, the not your mule hashtag develops. And I'm just wondering, what do we do with that kind of a moment for both paying respect to and taking very seriously um, uh, the need for in kind of internally based community work and coalitional cross community work? Ooh, that's I wow. know, I know. That's, just, but that's, <laughs> that's the, the last question. question? Of, that's the question. I well, can't just slide out of here no. before that. It's the last Dang. question. It's the last question because of we. Oh, because of we. Because of we. Going because back to the we question. Who we be, we gonna be, we is important to you. We, the, yeah. the possibility of a we, and, yeah, and, 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 that way. Yeah. and, and I think that, yeah, um, and, and you end about the migrant in the book, about the migrant as this important figure that's not the immigrant, but the migrant is the in-between, mm -hmm. that is possibly a place of connection. Right. Um, but it seemed to me like Oscar's, I'm trying to ground it a little bit in Oscar's so white, because it seemed to me a, a moment of, of where things just went off the rails a little bit. Yeah. Um, in terms of possibilities of coalition, um, that didn't work the way that they were supposed to work. Yeah, and, and you, wow, I mean, that's, that's a great reading, and it's a peculiarly, pecul I have a very hard time, I'm from Hawaii, so I have a hard time saying peculiar. You did but very it's well. A very, okay, yeah. I try, I try, I try. Um, <laughs> so so it, it's a strange question. That's an easy word to say. Yeah. It's a very strange question, and it's, it's talking about sort of the strangest of race. And it's also a very Los Angeles question. Right? Can't help it. No, it's yeah. really it's yeah. a really Los Angeles question. I mean, that's what shaped my reaction to what was going on with it. So, just to recap, yeah, what sorry. happens is, is Oscar So White comes out, right, uh, and then Jose Antonio Vargas um, uh, starts posting uh, as the Oscar ceremony is going on this year, not last year's Oscars ceremony, but this year, saying, "Going uh, well, what about uh, what is Chris Rock?" basically gonna speak to what's happening to uh, Latinos and Asian Americans. Um, and in reaction, um, uh, um, Mickey Kendall s puts up this thing, well, I'm not your mule, using this hilarious um, Zora Neale Hurston reference, right? Um, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> uh, it, it was very serious and it was very hilarious at the same time. But it's like, I'm not trying to be your mule, right? right? You can't have black folks carrying the work of everybody uh, on this. Um, and then this sort of intra thing breaks out. Um, and Jose comes back the next day and he's like, actually, this is actually not what I meant or intended. And his work right now is on looking at anti-blackness in Asian and Latino uh, and non-black uh, people of color, immigrant of color communities. Um, and it's it's... He was thinking about it before this, but it's also in reaction to thinking about how, how you continue to move this forward. Um, and I, the reason I say that it's a very Los Angeles question is these are exactly the kinds of questions that we were confronting after the Los Angeles riots. And so if we get into the question of cultural equity and we point out the overwhelming whiteness of the sector that produces our culture, mm -hmm. which is predominantly the culture industry because government has been wiped out, and the nonprofit arts sector doesn't fund actually a large portion of, of, of art and creation. Um, if, we, if we unpack that, right, what happens next, right? If we're able to achieve right. representation, what happens next? We're still at the beginning of that discussion. So we've got our Asian American, our Chinese American, let's be specific, our Chinese American sitcom, right? We've got our Mexi Mexican American um, sitcoms. We've got our middle class African American sitcom now, right? But what happens when you get beyond sort of the uh, um, whatever, the ER, uh, Grey's Anatomy kind of mode or model or vision of multiculturalism and you start really getting real, <laughs> so to speak. Is that a plug for the real world? No, it's okay. not. It's really not. <laughs> maybe, um, they should, I, maybe they should pay me on this. Yeah. But, but that's, those are the questions that we're going to be confronting. And yeah. it's the strangeness of race that we have to be dealing with all of these questions exactly. all at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I do think in the part of where your, the new book ends is it with this spirit of um, the importance of always looking at the possibility of coalition. Right? And you talk about um, you, you, you ask out loud, how have we grown apart from each other? Right. Right? Um, and we were talking backstage a little bit about that idea. And I just think it's such an important way to end this book um, and to end in this moment 
uh, of the we as this floating term mm -hmm. that can meet, that means all kinds of different things to so many different people. Yeah, it can um, be contested. Th that needs to be tested and, yeah. um, and rehearsed again and again and again. Mm. Um, so we have, we have microphones. Um, people can come in the aisles. We'll take questions in the aisles. We've got mics for folks. And we've got about, I think, uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, or whatever, for questions. Questions, please. If you have um, really awesome speeches, try to put a question mark at the end. And there goes the extra credit crowd. <laughs> 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 I know that, I know that, I know that departure. <laughs> uh, okay. Hi. Uh, I haven't read your book, uh, but I just saw your books outside when I was coming in, and I was just kind of curious about your use of Av, um, and in use general. Use of what? Use of Av, Av, African American Vernacular English. Okay, got it, yeah. Like, we gone be all right. Yeah. that kind of thing, or yeah. who we be. Right. I was just kind of wondering what the use of that was about. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask you also about just, um, well, yeah, I can, you kind of addressed it in your last question, but uh, regarding um, using black movements as like the, you know, or using black movements as like the kind of coattails that other movements are grabbing onto. Uh, kind of wanted your opinion on that. Sure. Um, so yeah, I get, I get asked this question a lot and it goes to the debate I think that's really been um, popping back up in the last couple of years around cultural appropriation, right? That's what you're really asking about in a lot of ways. Um, and you know, uh, we're gonna be all right um, and sort of the, the title Who We Be and even Can't Stop, Won't Stop, right? All of these titles come from hip hop. Um, the question that I always get asked and, and gets asked of, of many Asian American hip hop fans is, um, is, you know, is this appropriation? Are you trying to appropriate? Are you trying to exploit here? Are you trying to extract here? Um, for me, what I can say from a personal point of view, that's the only way that I can answer the question, is that I have been influenced um, by hip hop uh, by black music, by black art and culture, just like millions and millions of other folks have. And what, I try to, what I've tried to do is to use that as an entry point to understand more. Um, the, the, the amazing thing about art is that it opens up these types of veins of empathy that could be found, right? And there's the possibility in a non-hierarchical relationship of an exchange. Um, and I think that maybe I'm a little bit optimistic about that kind of a thing, um, but that's what I would hope for. I would hope that, um, that I would be able to not stand in somebody else's shoes. I can't do that. But to maybe, maybe understand what it might mean for someone to stand in those shoes uh, and then to be able to find the point of connection there that allows me to be uh, not just an ally, but an accomplice, right? Somebody who can find their own stakes in this particular kind of battle. I feel like folks who are non-black seeing the movement for black lives shouldn't be asking the question, um, what is my job, right? They should be thinking about what it is that they should be listening to and learning about, uh, and then figuring it out for themselves and doing the work that they need to do uh, in that. So maybe that's not the, where you wanted to go with that particular question, um, but it's sort of where I took it, I guess. And maybe it speaks a little bit more of, of um, my particular kind of personal practice uh, around this. What I've said, I think, during this entire time is that the, for, for Many folks, the movement has been generative. It's forced these kinds of conversations um, that relate to um, people's positioning, right? I, I couldn't have ended this book without having an essay on Asian Americanness. Um, so I have this chapter in here called The In-Betweens. Um, and this is a chapter in which um, I'm trying to kind of unpack 
how the Black Lives Matter movement has forced me to be able to think about uh, these types of questions. Um, I think that in order for us to fight for racial justice, which in turn is the key to figuring out the question of justice all across the board, right? That we do have to center these questions that the Black Lives Matter uh, leaves us with, right? At the same time, we have to understand the intersectionalities that are occurring. Right. So a lot of the work that I do is around undocumented folks, right? And uh, there's a lot of work that's being done, for instance, around Islamophobia. And these constitute sort of a constellation of ways in which powers try to divide us, right? And, and so it morphs over time. It morphs over time. At different points, different things kind of move to the surface. What we're seeing at this particular moment is a presidential candidate that's thrown all of them into this deplorable basket, <laughs> right? and said, hey, here's where we're at. So we all kind of figured out, you know, what the enemy looks like at this particular point, what the enemy is talking about in this particular instance. Um, but for, for us to be able to achieve justice, we have to be able to all transform, I think. And those who are uh, at the most vulnerable position, the communities that are in the most vulnerable position, should be the folks who should be leading it. Question in the back. If you have questions, if you could bring the mics down or go to the aisle. Yes. Just a little bit closer. Or I'm a little bit confused there. You're good. You just want me to ask a question here? Or do you want me to? Oh no, you can. You're okay. good. Alrighty, just checking. Um, so hi, uh, I um, took notice of how much reverence you gave to Kendrick, um, and uh, I was curious uh, as to uh, your thoughts on another icon. Lil Wayne and uh, his uh, recent comments about racism um, and the quote unquote absence of it. Uh, and I was wondering how you felt about that statement and about what that could potentially mean, not, not only for um, what we are trying to currently do now, uh, but also just with other artists who could potentially follow suit, um, you know, uh, because he is a fairly popular figure and maintains a certain, you know, iconography, so. Um, Actually, you uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the context? I hadn't yeah. heard about what happened. So uh, Wayne recently said that uh, he thinks that racism isn't a thing, mm. um, and that he's quote unquote never experienced it personally, uh, so can't speak on it. And so I was wondering uh, where you st stood basically on that kind of uh, on that kind of ideology, I oh. guess. Everyone start tweeting as soon as Jeff starts weighing in on Lil Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I, yeah, I don't know what the context is for it. I know that a lot of, I mean, this is sort of the, the uh, like, what would be considered like the anti-Kaepernick crowd too, right? Um, folks who feel like my job is to be an athlete or my job is to rap or my job is to entertain and it's not my job to, to make comments on these kinds of things. So it's a diversion. It's a, it's a way of kind of ducking the question. Um, and I think in the long run, you know, what, what happens is, is the people validate it or they don't validate it. Um, and I think that in this particular moment, he's on the wrong side of history, clearly. Um, and so folks will see the, the, the consequences of that. I'm not really sure what the reaction has been either, but imagine that it's probably not been that, all that positive. Um, so yeah. But it's also, I think, a good reminder that, of, the, of just how, how non-monolithic any of these conversations are, that, that within communities, um, historically, not just in this particular moment, but even if you go back to um, you know, 1950s and 1960s, there was, a, there was a, quite a bit of, particularly with popular entertainers, of uh, folks who didn't want to step up and folks who wanted to stay, uh, you know, who wanted to be in the limelight and talking, of, in, in the, you know, the political limelight and talking about um, social justice and others who didn't want to talk about it. Um, and also in the 80s and 90s. I mean, where about you mentioned the, the formativeness of the 92 uh, uprisings and coming up on the 25th anniversary in the spring, um, people might have watched or seen the um, O.J. Simpson documentary, um, you yeah, know, where a lot of this came up, yeah. which I thought was a really fascinating part of that, was going back to the, his tensions mm -hmm. as a black athlete with Ali, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, as a kind of refusal to, 
to speak out. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not, uh, and I wouldn't say this is an, an isolated incident. It's something that, that, that happens throughout movements um, over time. And we got to also offer the opportunity for Lil Wayne to change. Totally. I mean, look at what happened to Michael Jordan, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. One in the front here. There's a mic that's roaming, maybe. This will be the last question. I have one over here. Oh, he had his hand. Can we do two really quick? Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, hey. hey. Um, I was, you touched on this a little bit, um, but I was wondering, how do you see a quote-unquote neoliberal version or vision of social justice um, exist with transformative change and material gains for the oppressed communities? Because, um, you know, like diversity and the corporate sector has often been used as a tactic to mask over um, like great inequalities in the workplace. So I'm just wondering, you talked about Beyonce's song, um, you know, uh, but how do you, how do you see them coexist? How do I see neoliberalism? Um, neoliberal social justice, or I guess um, a, you know, capitalist version of social justice uh, exist with transformative uprooting change? That's actually a really complicated <laughs> question. Um, you were just telling me about the student, former student of yours in the app, which is an interesting. Right, thinking about um, how, so yeah, thinking about how to utilize different types of tools. I mean, the question, the question that, 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 that comes in when you say we're gonna bum rush the show is, is um, how far can you actually take it, right? And, um, and I'm not uh, somebody who's willing to rule out the possibility that possibilities can be opened up by being able to use, um, you know, these sort of corporate neoliberal types of tools. Twitter, right? Facebook um, uh, have been used as tools to be able to launch movements, to be able to sustain movements. Stanford, um, USC. Stanford, USC. <laughs> yeah. I mean, shit. You know, it's <laughs> it's. Uh, you know, and, and so it's, it's to me part of uh, a range of, of tactics as long as we're keeping our eyes on the prize and we're, we're maintaining our sort of critical selves. Um, we should be able to entertain different types of tactics and strategies in, in our movement towards, you know, justice for all and for a transformation. We have to start where, where folks are at, I think, to be able to move them where they need to go. So. Very patient, thank you. Yes. Um, so I kind of had like a question along the same lines, but like more specifically. So like, um, I think one of the biggest disagreements that I kind of come across with my friends when we talk about like artists and artists who are engaging in a lot of these like very, um, very uh, activist related um, conversations about race and inequity. Um, so like, how do you reconcile these like kind of market motivations with these artists, right? So like, how do you sorry, like market motivations market motivations right so like like capitalism you know money making motivation so like does beyonce charging 40 dollars for a tank top made probably by like some kid you know like mm -hmm. in a foreign country how does that like kind of how does she like how do you negotiate that right that she's talking about a lot of inequity she's talking about a lot of like um racism and a lot of these forces that create this inequity but at the same time like she's engaging with these forces that also propagate that right absolutely um, I mean, I think it's our, our job to call that stuff out, you know, um, as people who are, are um, doing the work, right? And to say, here's the ideal that you uh, are putting forward, we're gonna hold you to, the, to that higher standard. So it's in this relationship between artists and audience that a lot of those kinds of questions um, uh, get resolved, right? Um, not all artists are at the stage of wokeness that you know we would hope them to be, um, but I think that again, you know, it's sort of about thinking about what the trajectory is uh, over the long run, right? And so, um, so yeah, so it's 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 a process as everything else is, um, and ultimately, I'm somebody that kind of remains tries to remain optimistic at the end of the day, uh, hopeful that we'll be able to kind of move all in the right direction. Thank you all so much for Thank coming you all out. For coming. Jeff, Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give a big round of applause yeah. to Jeff and Josh.